now. And we'll begin record. Alrighty, good morning everybody. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Tatiana Calderon. I'm the Autism Initiative Coordinator here at Synergia. Um, we'll be beginning in a, just about a minute, so I just want to give a few instructions for those that are joining us. Um, this presentation is available with closed captioning. Um, additionally, we are providing uh, simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, for which now we'll provide the instructions for Spanish attendees to join. Um, so, hoy siempre brindamos in, uh, servicios de interpretación simultánea para nuestros eventos, igual que aquí en Zoom. So, por favor, de hacer clic en el globo al fondo de su pantalla donde dice interpretación y luego haga clic en el idioma que desee escuchar, en este caso español. Si quiere escuchar solo al intérprete, también puede hacer clic en Mute Original Audio que se silenciará el audio original. Muchísimas gracias de... Um, Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. De nuevo, bienvenidos a Sinergia. Uh, estamos agradecidos tenerlos aquí. So, right before I begin, I want to go through some uh, brief housekeeping notes. Um, so, uh, firstly, this uh, presentation is being recorded and broadcasted through Facebook Live. We encourage questions at any time, uh, but we please just remember this is a public forum and we are being broadcasted. And there will be a poll activated at the end of this presentation. Um, so, all right, let's get started, everybody. So, again, my name is Tatiana Calderon. I'm the Autism Initiative Coordinator here at Synergia's Metropolitan Parent Center. I just wanted to share a few words about Synergia's Autism Initiative. Our Autism Initiative project is funded by a grant from the New York City Council under its Autism Initiative. This project supplements the work of Synergia's uh, Metropolitan Parent Center by bringing increased awareness to New York City residents, particularly to communities with large Spanish-speaking populations um, about the growing population of children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. Its strong outreach components targets families of children with su suspected or known diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, who are not receiving the appropriate educational, health, or other related services. The initiative will link them to other services and supports that meet the individual needs of children and families. Um, and we wanna thank you all for being here today. Um, and welcome to Synergia. So right before we get into it, I just wanted to share a little bit about our presenter today, uh, Dr. Gilbert M. Foley. Dr. Foley uh, serves as a consulting clinical psychologist at the New York Center for Child Development in New York City and clinical co-director of the New York, uh, New York City Early Childhood Mental Health Training and Technical Assistance Center, TTAC. He has had a private practice serving young children and their families for over 30 years with a specialization in mental health services and developmental disabilities. Dr. Foley is also the co-author of four books and has written over 50 scholarly articles uh, and chapters linking sensory integration, mental health, nurturing self-regulation in infants and young children has just been published by National Zero to Three. So Dr. Foley, welcome to Synergia. I'm so happy that you could join us today. I'm sure we have plenty of questions for those joining us. We will have a Q&A session at the end for everybody to ask their questions and I'll be handing it over to Dr. Foley now. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Tatiana, a pleasure to be here. I also want to thank Anna, who will be translating, and Michael Brown from New York Center for Child Development, who uh, made the connection. So um, I'm going to share my screen now, and then we'll proceed with the presentation. Okay. So welcome, parents, caregivers, colleagues. It's it's uh, a delight to be here. Now, the topic today is sensory diet, but you'll note from a psychological perspective, and the reason I say that is that the whole sensory diet idea and practice really comes from the profession of occupational therapy. And you will note two OTs are listed who have made contributions and from whom I've taken information, but I am not an occupational therapist, I'm a psychologist. So it's through the psychological lens. And I always say, when I do these presentations, uh, I always defer to occupational therapists. And ultimately, you know, I think if you have questions, particularly anything about your own children or any specifics, you really need to confer with an occupational therapist. So 
that is a very strong um, caveat. So uh, let's start right from the beginning. Uh, and that is to uh, basically define what we mean by a sensory diet. Uh, oh, I just want to add that I have had the privilege over my career to work very closely with occupational therapists. In fact, um, early in my career, we're talking in the 70s, I had the opportunity to spend um, uh, almost a week with uh, Pat Wilbarger. And she was an OT who was... Uh, consulting at a, at a uh, institution that I was working. She's the person, the occupational therapist who actually coined and developed um, the concept of a sensory diet, Pat Wilbarger. So what do we mean by a sensory diet? So it is a, uh, it's a collection of body-based activities. Body-based is the important word here. They're not I mean, they have intellectual and perceptual components, but it really is um, at the level of real bodily experience. So they're a collection of body-based activities that are very individually tailored to your child's sensory profile. Uh, and we'll talk about what we mean by a sensory profile. And what is the aim of a sensory diet? Well, it's to help your child calm down stay organized, but also to alert, pay attention, recover from states when they're a little bit out of bounds, you know, whether it's a tantrum, what we call a meltdown, um, to get themselves back into a state where they're ready to relate and to learn, and to sustain optimal levels of arousal at school and at home. You know, we all have to keep our engine running, right? And uh, we don't want our engine running so fast that we are not able to um, really be available, nor do we want our engine to be running so slow that we are um, uh, kind of out of it. And so, you know, it's, it, arousal is very, very important. And I also want to say about dysregulated states, you know, we usually think of a dysregulated state more like a meltdown or temper tantrum. Uh, or possibly what will look like aggression, although it's not always aggression in the true sense. Uh, but we have to remember a, a, a dysregulated state can be the other end of that continuum, that uh, kind of range, meaning that the child is too quiet, too withdrawn, not able to get, as I said, their engine running enough. So it's not always the meltdown um, state that we would consider dysregulated. It can also be um, the other state, too withdrawn, their emotions too muted, and so on and so forth. Okay. So who develops a sensory diet? A sensory diet is typically very individually tailored to meet your child's sensory needs by an occupational therapist. And uh, an, occupational th an occupational therapist do a wide range of things. Um, they treat adults, for example, who may have had a brain injury or a hand injury, and they work in rehabilitation. But uh, there are, of course, pediatric occupational therapists who work with children, and there is a subspecialty within occupational therapy called sensory integration. Now, most occupational therapists uh, get training in sensory integration as a part of their uh, education to become an occupational therapist, but it is a also a very specialized training. So ideally, you would want to have a, a pediatric occupational therapist uh, and one who uh, has maybe had uh, the uh, sort of training in sensory integration above and beyond uh, their professional training to be an occupational therapist. Now, how do occupational therapists arrive at this sensory diet? Well, first they observe your child, right? Observation is always important. We need to uh, observe the child in various settings. Um, very often they will do some form of formal assessment um, 
Some of it will be report from teachers and parents. Uh, some of it will be, of course, actually watching your child in a uh, structured situation. And of course, they always consult with you as parents and then teachers and caregivers, because we all believe that as parents, you know your child best. And so uh, you need always to teach us about your child and what they're, who they are and what they're like and what you think they need. So out of this careful uh, assessment, they will then uh, come up with um, this, uh, this collection of uh, body-based experiences individually tailored to help your child. And um, that will begin to form the body of what will be called the sensory diet. Now, when we think of a sensory diet, what are some things that you as parents might see on a sensory diet? Um, well, this is a very broad um, spectrum of uh, the kinds of uh, body-based experiences that in each of the sensory systems, and we will talk about the sensory systems later, but in each of the sensory systems, the kinds of very broad experiences that tend to organize or calm the child and the kinds of experiences that tend to alert or bring their engine up to speed. So in the visual system, uh, dim natural light is calming and organizing. Strobe lights, uh, and strobe lights are a little bit dangerous because if a child has any seizure activity, that could trigger it. So I, I would prefer just say bright light or uh, et cetera. Uh, in the hearing system, rhythmic hearing, rhythmic language, music, speaking in a way that is calming and organizing, uh, loud and dissonant sounds. In the system that has to do with muscles and joints, which we call proprioception, and I'll talk more about that word. And I also want to say, I will be using technical language, but I will be translating it because, and please feel, if you don't understand, I, I really would like to know, and do not be embarrassed. There's no reason you know, for you to know some of this language. Um, but proprioception really has to do with information sensations we get from our muscles and joints, right? So right now you might be sitting and you're getting some sensations through your bottom. That's proprioception. If you're standing, you may be getting some sensations through your calves and, and your knees. That's proprioception. Now, um, heavy work is something we'll talk more about. Heavy work, what OTs mean by heavy work, is where we're really putting pressure uh, through the muscles and the joints. We're pushing against. It can be like if you do a push-up, that's heavy work. If you lift something heavy, a, a, a bag or a box, that's heavy work. Um, this is any kind of, re if you lift weights, that's heavy work. Any kind of resistance. Now, what you'll notice here is that heavy work, deep pressure through the muscles and the joints actually works in both ways. It can calm and organize and it can alert and activate. So that's your, often in a sensory diet, you will see a lot of so-called heavy work activities. In the vestibular system, which we will talk about, that's in your inner ear, and that tells us about balance and motion. Um, uh, we know slow rocking, rhythmical rocking is calming, and spinning is activating. In the touch system, tactile system, again, pressure touch, deep touch, right? As opposed to light touch, something like tickling. Tickling tends to activate. Deep tactile input tends to calm. In the taste system, Sucking and chewing, crunching, you know, the, uh, well, sucking, chewing is calming and crunchy, 
biting down hard and sour taste tend to bring us up. And in the breathing, deep, slow counting, getting our breathing down into a rhythmical pattern as opposed to blowing and sucking, which tend to activate. So this is just a very broad, uh, and, and I'm not suggesting you do any of these things without consulting an occupational therapist, but on, on, these might be some of the kinds of sensory experiences that an occupational therapist will prescribe. So again, what are some other kinds of activities, modifications, and suggestions that an OT might include in your sensory diet? So here are some kinds of experiences um, that involve the touch system, right? Um, it might be, uh, you know, uh, any experience that increases your awareness and as promotes desensitization through graded experience. And what does that mean? You know, some children are very sensitive to rough textures, for example. You know, they don't want to wear woolens. Or if you put on uh, some new clothes that they haven't worn before and they haven't been washed, jeans, and they might react very, very much to them because it feels very uncomfortable to them. And if a child really has a sensory problem, and remember, 87% of children on the autism spectrum have some kind of sensory atypicality. So it is very common that children on the autistic spectrum will have some sensory problem. There are children who just have sensory processing problems, but are not on the spectrum. So as a colleague of mine, Stan Greenspan, Dr. Gwen, Stan Greenspan used to say, almost every child on the spectrum has a sensory problem, but not every child with a sensory problem is on the spectrum. But uh, you know, helping them to get used to different textures in small doses so that they can over time tolerate them. Things like rolling a ball over the child's body, giving them deep pressure, playing with a variety of materials, sand, water, paint, clay, beans, shaving cream might be on your child's sensory diet. Uh, upright roll, rolling on a wall, Say, okay, boys and girls, let's all roll over to the door. But we're getting a lot of input through our whole skin system. Uh, being wrapped up tight, right? Um, many children with uh, sensory tactile like being swaddled, not unlike a baby, because it helps them feel safe and it gives them compression. Um, again, using the both the visual and the touch system, working on glass, rubbing with a, you know, sandpaper, um, you know, all of these kinds of things. And also uh, helping children to recognize if they're being touched, where they're touched. Now, these are just some kinds of examples of the kinds of activities you might find on a sensory diet if the child has particularly um, a tactile needs. Now I talked about heavy work because that one uh, is those activities, uh, as we pointed out, both have the capacity to calm and organize as well as to get your engine running faster. So these are um, these kinds of activities you're likely to see on a sensory diet for children who are hypersensitive, too sensitive, or children who are too underreactive. Now here, any kind of you know pushing against resistive materials, it could be hammering on a workbench. It could be rolling out clay with a, with a rolling pin where you have to put a little heft into it. Uh, body compression, push and pull, tug of war, for example, can give you a lot of deep. Stretchy band. Sometimes OTs will recommend if a child is having some trouble sitting still, putting some stretchy bands across the legs of the chair. So when they're sitting, they can push their legs back and forth, their ankles against something. Uh, creeping on all fours is always good. 
um, pushing against the wall, um, pushing away from the wall. If you're like on a on a scooter board, which is like a flat board, a little bit a little bit like a scooter, but it's a flat board with wheels, and pushing yourself off. Sometimes um, pushing a heavy crate or a shopping a little shopping cart filled with books across the room again gives you that head. Playing with rubber bands, fiddling, fidgeting uh, can be very helpful for some of these kids. Uh, setting up rumble rooms um, uh, where uh, children can engage in rough and tumble play, foam swords, knock down build up play, building up with blocks, knocking them down. Pillow sandwich is something you'll also sometimes see where you put the child down on some pillows and put some pillows on top and go squish, 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 giving them deep pressure through the body. And then you may see on your child's sensory diet, uh, vestibular activities. Now vestibular activities, again, are those that activate the inner ear and have to do with balance and with motion, right? So balancing on a big, big therapy ball, bouncing on it, um, being able to uh, be on all fours and then maybe put one leg up and balance on three, uh, two arms and a leg, for example. Uh, sitting on a barrel and playing kind of king of the mountain where playfully kids are trying to knock you off. Uh, rocking horses, rocking chairs, swings. Now you'll know OTs often have suspended equipment in their actual clinics um, where children might be in a hammock and swung. There might be a platform swing hung from a ceiling and the child might be on their tummy or sitting and swinging again to give them a sense of motion through their inner ears. Um, being pulled on a hardboard sled, kneeling or, or, or on their feet, um, hand knee balancing, skiing down a carpet covered in a, like a ramp uh, on a sheet of plastic in a crouched position, all gives them this um, information through muscles and joints. So those are the kinds of things you might see when your child's sensory diet and the OT has, has been able to determine that your child needs some specialized information through those sensory systems. So um, here are some other, uh, another colleague of mine, actually Susan Stallings is an OT. She and I just wrote the book, Linking Sensory Integration and Mental Health. She is the first author, she is an OT. These are some kinds of things, you know, that an OT right, might recommend to a teacher, for example, or to you as a parent, you know, uh, create a classroom or a playroom with close boundaries for quiet play. Um, have it maybe a small tent so the child can get away from it all, get into a quiet and closed environment, maybe being in a tunnel, but also for other children playing in open areas. Um, have a wall area with limited visuals. You know, sometimes our classrooms and even our playrooms have too much material and we have to also worry about overstimulation. So having some areas where there isn't anything on the wall. Um, using a hula hoop, for example, to sit inside during floor times for a sense of boundary. So there are some children in circle time might do better sitting on the floor inside of a hula hoop because they're getting more information through those muscles and joints. And they also have a clear area that they know is sort of their boundary. Um, ball chairs or active motion stools, uh, sitting on a, on a rocking chair maybe in circle time or on what's sometimes called the tea stool, two, two pieces of wood. Now, if the child has enough balance so that they can give themselves a little motion if they need it. Um, a basket full of fidget, fidget tool, uh, things. Uh, and remember fabrics, curtains, and carpets that absorb sound because some children are very sensitive to noise uh, or echoing in a room. Uh, sometimes we put socks on chairs uh, or we cut a tennis ball in half and put them on the base of the chair so they don't scrape against the floor and make a screeching sound. 
Um, and then providing movement breaks is so important for young children and children on the spectrum. They need to move. We try to avoid too, too much sitting um, and uh, for too long a time. And please never take away recess as a consequence, right? Kids' brains need movement and uh, to learn. So uh, OTs on, uh, or two kids in a sea stall, giving themselves, row, row, row your boat. Again, giving them that auditory, but also vestibular input. Back-to-back -back push ups from the floor. Two children have their backs together and they try to get up together. Uh, wall pushing, uh, all of those are deep pressure. So these are the kinds of things OT might also recommend as a part of the sensory diet to teachers and parents. So what do we think sensory diets do? Now, the aim of a sensory diet is usually to reduce immediate stress in recurring situations, for example, in a classroom. Uh, I want to say immediate stress, right? It's, it, it's not a long-term treatment. Um, it is more immediate. Um, you know, long-term treatment is probably going to go through individual sensory integration. Remember, in constructing a sensory diet, the OT considers each child's unique sensory profile the context in which they're in, and the, their overall organization and development. Again, the outcome is a short-term change. Uh, sensory diets need to be revisited on a regular basis. One, you know, they don't, you know, they change because as you well know, our children, particularly young children, they change very, very much. No one sensory experience is always calming or organizing or arousing with the exception of pain. And when a child is in a dysregulated state uh, and it seems to occur over and over, we always first need to rule out, is that child in some kind of physical or dental pain? Uh, very, very important to keep in mind. So again, who typically prescribes a sensory diet? They're typically designed to be implemented by parents, teachers, and caregivers, but used always with the guidance from an occupational therapist. The occupational therapist may not always be there, but the occupational therapist should demonstrate to the teacher or the parent how to implement these activities and what to look for um, to know when it's too much or too little. So, and how should sensory diet activities be implemented? I just want to say they're not meant to be implemented as a drill or an exercise routine. They're to be implemented in a relationship. They should be playful. They should be pleasurable. There should be interaction between you as parents or a teacher. And they should be implemented on a regular basis or interval as they may be described by the, by the, uh, in the sensory diet. So again, I want to point out, it's not meant to be like a, a drill or an exercise routine. Anything we do with young children should be fun. I apologize. There is some background noise. They're doing some work here where I am. And um, uh, I, I couldn't change that. So that is what a sensory diet is who prescribes a sensory diet and what it might look like. Now for us to really understand a little more deeply about why a sensory diet makes sense, we need to know something about the sensory systems, about sensory processing, about what we mean by self-regulation and what we mean by sensory processing disorders. So let's start with looking at the sensory systems. Now, we all know the basic five senses, right? Touch, vision, hearing, taste, and smell. The, of those, they're all important. Uh, of those basic five, uh, uh, I, won't, I will be only talking about touch with any depth. So the tact, and the reason I'm talking about touch of the five sensory systems that we all know is because Dr. Jean Ayers, 
who is considered the mother of sensory integration and occupational therapy. She was one of the first to really talk about children who have hypersensitivities on the skin. And she felt, and her research suggested, if you had hypersensitivity in the skin, you were very likely often to have hypersensitivities or possibly have hypersensitivities elsewhere. And remember, the skin is the largest organ in the body. We forget that. So it's a very, very important system. And as you know, the receptors for the, um, the tactile system are in the skin. They're you know, receptors for pressure, receptors for, for thermal sensations, et cetera. Now you might ask, why is this little man over here? And the reason is because uh, we believe that we all have in our brain, in the parietal lobe, we have a model of our body. It's not conscious, uh, but we have a, it's like a map. We have a map of our body. And how does that map uh, develop? One of the primary ways it develops is through the tactile system. And we use that map a lot because, you know, if we do things where, let's say, we don't have vision, we are relying on that map. So you may be familiar with, you know, in a neural, one of the, one of the tasks in a typical neurological exam is close your eyes, put your arms out and touch your nose. Well, how can we do that? We think we can do that because we are unconsciously and automatically referring to our body map. That body map is very important. So you see, I just want to point out, if you're not getting accurate information through your tactile system, either you're getting your oversensitive or you're undersensitive, you're not going to get accurate information about your body. And that body map may not develop. So it's very, very important. Um, remember that the tactile system is, is, uh, develops first in the uterus. So it is so important right in the uterus. Um, I think what's important to remember is that tactile system has two parts. One part is our defensive system. So if you're in a dark alley and someone taps you on the back, you better believe we're going to look around and we're going to alert, right? That's our defensive system. Then there's another system, part to it, that is what we call our protective system. And uh, I'm sorry, our discriminative system. And this is, you know, if I said to you, oh, do you happen to have a quarter and you reach in your pocket, you wouldn't necessarily have to look at all your coins. You could probably by feel determine which is the quarter. That's our discriminative system. Now, for the most part, our protective system isn't always on red alert. It's available to us if we need it, but it isn't always right at the front of our uh, awareness. The discriminative system should be, but in children who have oversensitivity in the tactile system, sometimes their protective system is always on and it's always on too much. And these are the kinds of kids who can misinterpret a touch that may not be hostile at all, but they may misinterpret it as aggression. So for example, the children are lined up waiting to go to the playground and someone you know, accidentally bumps against them getting their clothes. The child whose protective system is always on red alert, that child's likely to misinterpret that as aggression and then push back and so on and so forth. So this is how these sensory uh, systems, of course, have an impact on our behavior because they tell us about the state of our body and they tell us about the state of the world. And if they're not giving us accurate information about our bodies and the world, then we're going to act on what we what our sensory systems tell us. And they may be out of sync with the rest of the kids. And that's why this is so important in relationship to behavior. Now, I mentioned to you the proprioceptive system. We don't, we, that's not among the five systems, we, you know, five senses we typically think of. But these, the receptors for the proprioceptive system are in the muscles and the joints and the tendons. And the proprio system, 
Again, uh, by nine weeks, uh, five weeks, the, the embryo feels pressure on its lips. It tells us about pressure by nine weeks on the arms. And it gives us information about where our body is in space and the relationship of one body part to the other. So it has a lot to do with coordination, a lot to do with coordination. Um, and it also tells us something about the rate and the timing of our movements and about the specific force we exert in a movement. So, you know, we've all met those, the kids who always throw the dodgeball too hard. Is it aggression? Maybe. But could that child have some dysfunction in their proprioceptive system and they're not getting inform accurate information about how hard they're throwing or they're pushing or they're tapping. So again, uh, gives us very, very important data. And then I talked about the vestibular system. It is related to the auditory system and it is in the semicircular canals in the auditory system. Now these canals are filled with fluid and they're lined with little hairs that we call cilia. Now, of course, if there's fluid in those canals, when you turn your head, you raise it up, uh, that fluid level is gonna shift, right? And as it shifts, it activates different parts of those little hairs called cilia, and it sends messages to our brain through the eighth cranial nerve. Now, <clears throat> again, it's developed in the second uh, trimester of of pregnancy, it's very important because it tells us where our head is in space. Um, so, so, you know, is our head vertical? Is our head tilted? Uh, so on and so forth. The vestibular system also mediates our muscle tone, but it has a lot to do with balance and equilibrium. You may have uh, had uh, relatives, you know, or, or, um, uh, sometimes uh, older adults um, get problems with their equilibrium, right? And it is a, a dysfunction in their vestibular, often, not always, can be a dysfunction in their vestibular system. We sometimes call it vertigo, uh, problems with balance. Um, it also has a lot to do with how we use our eyes, um, movements. Can we cross the midline? It has to do with states of arousal. How do we get ourselves more active, more alert? How do we calm ourselves down and go to sleep, for example? It has to do with attention. It has to do with keeping our emotions in regulation. And again, a lot to do with the um, understanding and perceiving how fast we're moving. And some children who get car sick, for example, may have a vestibular dysfunction their vestibular system might be uh, tuned up too high. And so even the motion of a car makes them sick, right? Then, you know, there are other children uh, who, uh, you know, these are kids who are always running too fast and can never seem to slow down. Again, they may not be getting accurate information through their vestibular system that tells them how fast they're going in an accurate way. So, uh, those systems in particular, uh, now all the senses are important, but um, OTs remind us that the tactile system, the proprioceptive system, and the vestibular system are very important. And often we don't think as much about them as non-OTs. And then there is a system now that we are learning a lot more about and thinking more about. And this is called the interoceptive system, a big word, but uh, intero, inside. This is the information we get from the inside of our body, right? Like, oh, I'm hungry, or I'm full, I'm ready to go, or I have to go to the bathroom, uh, or I've, I'm, I'm, I'm short of breath, or I've run and I'm gasping for breath. Uh, all of that information and from the inside of the body is very, very important. And we think it has a lot also to do with emotion uh, because often emotion starts with some changes in those internal organs. And then it reaches our brain and we say, oh, I'm, I'm annoyed or 
oh, I just feel a little down today. But some of it does start with the inside of the body. You know, we even have it in our language, right? I'm red with rage. I'm white as a ghost. Um, you know, I have butterflies in my stomach. Uh, those really, uh, I think, tell us that often the emotion that's associated, whether it's anger or fear um, uh, or, or feeling a little sick, um, those emotions may, may, uh, 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 may start from the inside of our body. So we're learning a lot more about the interoceptive system. So now what do these sensations have to do with what we call sensory processing? Well, the first thing we have to remember, we don't think about this so much, but remember we are, we live in a sensory bath. We are constantly being bombarded with information through touch, through vision, through sounds, as well as our position in our body, um, activities of the various organs, uh, street noises, uh, constantly. Now, think about it. If our central nervous system, our brain, could not filter out a lot of that information and we couldn't determine which was important, and needed our attention and which didn't, we probably couldn't function. We'd probably be so flooded that our central nervous system would shut down. Now, so think about children who may have a sensory processing disorder. And remember, 87% of children on the autistic spectrum do have at least one sensory atypicality. I, you know, think about how overwhelming the world must be if your systems can't filter it out. And what do we mean by sensory process? It is the organization then of all of those sensations from the body and the environment, filtering out which we should pay attention to, which we shouldn't, but for use, for use. Now, what do we mean by that? So, you know, you suddenly smell something and you, oh my goodness, something's burning on the stove. Well, there, your, your olfactory system, your smell system told you something from the environment that said, I better alert and see what's going on. Organize that sensation for use, right? Or you're out on a slippery pavement and you're getting messages from your vestibular system that I might slip. Well, you, you now exercise greater caution and you focus your attention on your balance. That's what we mean by sensory processing. That information is from the environment and the body is being organized for use to make us more adaptive in our environment, right? So it's not sensation just for the sake of sensation, although some sensations are just pleasurable, but Frequently, it is really to help us adapt in the world now. So think about if we're not getting accurate information. Well, we're probably not going to get it right. Our behavior is going to probably be a little bit out of sync, but it may have nothing to do with intentional behavior to be difficult or to be, you know, not, not comply. It could be that the child simply isn't getting the right data. And from the data they're getting, their behavior seems right but it's out of sync because the information is not accurate and then the use is out of whack, so to speak. Now, one of the things to remember, and this is where sensory integration comes in, we don't get, yes, we get information through the individual sensory channels, vision, touch, taste, vestibular, but they all, almost all, tend to be integrated or organized in the thalamus. And then that information is relayed to the front part of our brain for thinking, et cetera. So that's why we that integration is so important. It's not just each sensory system alone, but it's how they are organized. And so when OTs talk about a child having a sensory integrative disorder, they're not integrating that data accurately. 
So, and this is important to remember, I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but again, sensory input is not discrete. In reality, each sensory stimulus is cumulative in that it is added to the sensation that came before it. This is very important to all of us who work with young children, particularly young children on the spectrum or those who have a sensory processing disorder. Let's say they've been, you know, they've been in circle time. They've had all that stimulation. Now they go to the learning center. Well, the stimulation they had from the from the circle time now goes with them. And the stimulation they're getting at the learning center is added to that existing stimulation. So particularly children who are very sensitive, children on the spectrum, children with a sensory processing disorder, they can be quickly overloaded. Now for typical children, usually they can process it and they can filter it out so that one isn't getting added to the other, like putting kerosene on the fire. But for our children, one of my uh, important things I always say to parents and teachers, begin each new activity from the regulated state. Get the calm. So I finish circle time. Let's all get calm. Let's get our bodies quiet. Let's get our breathing. Now let's go to circle time. Think about and think about at home, like, well, it's going to be bedtime. Just think about all of the stimulation from the day, but now we're expecting the child to down regulate. Let's be sure we start cooling them off. Or let's say the child is playing and now you're getting ready to go out and the child doesn't want to stop playing. Well, all their, their, their sensory system is overactive and now you're going to get ready to go out and getting on their coat. Now you're adding more sensory system. Try to think in advance. Cool them down at the end of the play period. Get them calm. Get them quiet. And now start the going out. So we're not adding another dose of sensory input on top of an already activated sensory system. We do that to ourselves, don't we? Sometimes you say, okay, I'm just going to stop and take a deep breath. That's what we're doing. We're getting our sensory systems back to baseline, right? Back to baseline before we start a new one. And young children need that more. Typical children, but especially children on the autistic spectrum or those with a sensory uh, processing disorder. And Dr. Foley, before you continue, yes. we sure. do have a question from the same parent, two questions from the same parent in the chat. Um, she is asking, I would like to know uh, why when my son goes to sleep, he covers himself with a quilt and puts a pillow on top covering his face. He always does this. He's 17 years old and he is diagnosed with autism. Okay. So, you know, we talked about how uh, deep pressure um, is organizing for many children. So putting the covers over and maybe having the pillow over the head uh, gives increased pressure to the face, which is calming. And of course, trying to keep as much sound out as possible. And, you know, we do that too. I mean, you know, I, I know adults who sleep, who, who, who like having a lot of covers on them, for example. Um, and they like the weight of it. Now then there are others who, who don't. And that's why, of course, you know, each of our sensory needs are different, even within the typical range. And I wanna, I, I'm glad you brought this an excellent question because it also raises the idea that each of us, each of us, even those of us who don't have autism and don't have a sensory processing disorder do have sensory preferences, just as we have dietary preferences, right? Not, we don't all like the same foods. Well, some of us, we, we all have differences in sensory experiences we like. Some people love roller coasters. Some people are terrified and get sick. Some people like a, a motorcycle. Some people would never go on them. Some people think ice, ice skating and skiing is exciting. Other people wouldn't get near it. 
even those who don't have a sensory diet. So even children and adults who don't have a sensory processing disorder, we all have sensory preferences. So that, that's how Pat Wilberger, by the way, came to the word calling it a sensory diet. So she made it, she said, just like we have preferences about food, tastes, temperatures of food, we all have individual differences and preferences about our sensory needs. Now, so even some people not on the spectrum like to sleep under a lot of pill, a, a lot of covers, for example. I know some people who like the room very cold. Some people find that very uh, annoying. So your child might be doing that to give themselves some added pressure around the head, giving them some deep pressure through the pillow and the blanket, and then also blocking out the auditory. And it can be very adaptive. It, I, you know, we also want to look at that. What do children do themselves to help them? That's probably something your, your son or daughter does to help themselves go to sleep. That's how they get their sensory system calmed down, get the motor, get the engine to not run so fast. So it can be very adaptive. Thank you, Dr. Foley. And her second question or comment was, um, he also has a large sensory ball that he always sits on and he never uses a chair when he's at home. Is there anything that you can advise me to get him to use a chair? Well, I would first, first of all, I would say he's telling us, you know, our children tell us. Now, I had a, uh, one of my teachers was Sally Province, but she was very famous in her day. She, she was at the Yale Child Studies in there. And she used to say, the child will always tell you, it might be in code, but it's our job to decode it. And your child might be telling us he needs a little bit more of that bounce. He needs a little bit more of the rock. And he's giving it to himself. So I wouldn't take that away. Um, now, again, you would want to consult with his occupational therapist. But, you know, you, you might help him have a dose of that input he needs. And then maybe a next step would be to have him sit in a rocking chair. Right. Because then he's still going to give himself some of that vestibular input, but it'll be a little bit closer to sitting in a chair. Right. And then maybe start to introduce the chair in doses that he can tolerate because then it may be too much to sit for too long and he may his sensory system may need that that vestibular input for the bouncing the stimulation through the muscles and the joints so it could actually be very adaptive that your child is really doing something for himself that's good now i understand you want him to sit in a chair and we know you know we have expectations of school um but i would also say i think we particularly young children, I think we ask them to sit far too long. Um, you know, uh, so I, I don't necessarily, you know, you'd have to talk to your OT, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. But I understand your wish to move him incrementally to tolerating more chair sitting. Thank you, Dr. Foley. We do also have another question from Ms. Sure. Stephanie uh, Rondon. She states, my son digs his jaw into my arms uh, side of and the side of the couch. He also squeezes my arm intensely. Seems like he needs some sensory input. How can I decrease this behavior? Yes. So um, a good question. I would first say ask your occupational therapist. I remember I'm a psychologist, but um, I would give him something to squeeze, something else like, um, um, well, I mean, clay probably wouldn't be good, uh, but it could be something like something that's squishy um, that he could press against. Um, I can't think of something right off the top of my head, but, but uh, well, you could give him a, a, a pillow, maybe a, a small pillow. That's, that's, a, that's a, it's a little bit hard and he could squish against that or a stuffed toy to squish or a rubber ball to squish. See if you can give him something that gives him that input that he needs, which seems like it's tactile and proprioceptive. Instead of squeezing your arm, he could squeeze, uh, get that input that he needs from something that's a little more appropriate. Thank you, Dr. Foley. And just before we continue, we also have one more question. Um, Ms. Adriana says, hi, I understand they need a little calm down before moving to the next activity, but how can I help my daughter to get active, like wake up and move to her morning routine without a meltdown? Yeah. So now you're talking you know, a little bit about the other side, the child who is a little underreactive. 
and needs their engine going to get awake. Um, so, you know, what might you do is maybe um, as she's getting away, giving her some gentle deep pressure down the back, for example. Um, maybe you, your OT could recommend uh, uh, maybe a soft ball that you could roll down her back in a gentle way, not, not, a, not trying to alert her too quickly, to get her awake slowly and then incrementally increase the input. So, you know, once she starts to get up, then maybe you can do some stretches. Uh, and maybe you could push your hands together with her, give her a little input to the muscles and the joints, right? And make believe we're gonna wash our hands together. All that to start to get her body awake because there are kids, and these are the kids that often get missed, by the way, the ones that need to get their body awake. We pay a lot of attention to those who are overactive and overreactive, but the ones who need to get their engine awake, we, they, they tend to be not, not get enough attention because they're not usually a problem. Okay, so let's talk about self-regulation. Now, this is a complicated technical uh, definition, but that's really partly what the aim of all the sensory integration and sensory experiences are, is to help the child to learn to develop, uh, flexibly modulate and grade. Modulate and grade, that they don't have all or none. They're neither overreactive or shut down that they have a range of, of states in between in terms of their arousal, their reaction to sensation, their emotion and their behavior. That's what we're really trying to give them. We're also trying to help them to recover from dysregulated states. Now, remember, no one is always regulated all the time, including us, including me. I'll say, you know, there are times when I'm agitated, if I'm in a lot of traffic, I feel road rage, um, uh, but I have to get myself back down to the regulated state. And uh, so learning to get back into the regulated state from a dysregulated state is very important. And that's why I always say to parents and teachers, you don't want your kids so good all of the time because they'll never get any practice about how to get from overactive to calm or from too quiet to alert. That is in part practice, right? And of course, then how do I sustain a level of arousal um, so I can be appropriately alert for the right kind of activity. Uh, and of course, we want eventually the child to do it, per, you know, eventually increasingly uh, for themselves in support of goal-directed activities. Now, what I want to point out to you is this for all of us, even those of us who have typical nervous systems, neurotypical, in the early months, you know that with a baby, you have to provide almost all of the regulation, right? You have to keep them warm because their temperature system isn't yet working. You have to help them stay calm and content when they get too fussy, right? So you're providing almost all of the regulation by holding, rocking, walking, singing, right? Now, as the child moves through the preschool years, and I would even extend this, a lot of what we're doing is what's called co-regulation. We're helping the child to get themselves regulated. We turn over to the child, you know, more and more of the responsibility for getting themselves regulated. But a lot of our role as parents and teachers is really to help our kids stay regulated. And don't forget, we as adults need co-regulation too. So let's say you, you let's say you've been out and you've had a little bit too much to drink and you start to get a little rowdy and your friend says, you wait a minute, you're, you know, you're getting a little out of bounds here. Let, you know, let's go out and take a walk and calm down. That's co-regulation. Or you come home and your partner, you wanna to talk to your partner, you've had a miserable day. That's co-regulation. Self-regulation really doesn't start until about almost four and five. I think we expect our children to regulate themselves too quickly. They need our help to regulate, even typical children with neuro, you know, typical nervous systems. Now our children who have neurodiverse on the spectrum with sensory processing disorders um, will need a little more co-regulation 
or longer. So now what is a sensory processing disorder? Now, again, remember, all children on the spectrum have some sensory processing atypicality, but not every child with a sensory processing disorder is on the spectrum. So there are individuals who aren't on the spectrum, but also have a sensory processing disorder. So in a sensory processing disorder, it is difficulty responding appropriately to specific kinds of sensory information. Um, Individuals with a sensory processing disorder may have atypical motor, emotional attention or adaptive responses, but it's only considered a disorder when it causes significant difficulties in daily routines and tasks. There are three types of sensory processing disorders that in the psychological you know, literature, in the mental health literature that are identified, um, and that is in the DC zero to five, that is uh, the diagnostic classification system called DC-0-5. That's the only diagnostic classification system that has sensory processing disorder in it. So the sensory over-responsive disorder is the child who responds too much, too frequently, or for too long. These are the kinds of kids that, you know, they go to the birthday party, you expect kids to be excited, right? But the kid who can't calm down, you know, the other kids, you know, get themselves back quiet. And, and when the cape comes to blow out the candles, they're ready to kind of quiet and focus on it. But the kid with the over-responsivity disorder is probably not gonna get themselves, they're gonna need more co-regulation. They have a hard time filtering out information. It's like they're flooded with information. And children with over-responsivity tend also to have anxiety because for those kids, some of the sensory experiences that are pleasurable to a neurotypical kid are not pleasurable. They're not pleasurable, they're awful. So for example, a child with a tactile defensive oversensitivity who's being tickled, may, that may not be fun. That could be experienced virtually as torture. And it's for real, they're not just being difficult. The same kid with a tactile, disorder, sensor, tactile sensitivity disorder, you know, all the clothes they like to wear are in the wash and you want to put on a new shirt and they fight you like heck. It's not always because they're being aggressive or trying to be difficult. It could be because that new shirt that feels rough really, really to them feels awful, feels, feels scratchy, feels itchy, right? of uh, the child with an oral motor sensitivity and you're trying to brush their teeth. Some of those kids fight you like the devil because it really, to them, that does not feel pleasant. That feels awful. So again, and of course, then it re also relates to anxiety. So some of the kinds of things that you will find that the over-responsive children experience as aversive or toxic are light touch, loud noises, bright lights, unfamiliar smells and tastes, rough textures, and too much movement in space. These are the kinds of things that over-responsive children might have. Now, uh, the, you know, the, the, the uh, over-responsive disorder, we sometimes subdivide it into the those who become fearful and cautious and those who become kind of obstinate and dig in their heels. That's not a, that's more a qualitative difference. The, the broad category though is over-responsive, but you might have some kids who uh, again are fear, become fearful when they have sense, certain sensory experiences. They may cry, they may freeze. They may attempt to get out of the stimulus. These are the kinds of kids you've seen. There's too much noise and they've got their hands over their ears or there's too much stimuli and they go under the desk. They're trying to get away from it because it's overwhelming. You know, some of us love rock concerts and some of us hate them because they feel overwhelming and chaotic and we want to escape. Well, for these kids, it's, 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 it's more of that. Of course, if there's too much stimuli, they may become distractible and at some point they may actually become aggressive because they want to get away from the stimuli. Um, they may have tantrums, excessive startle reactions, motor agitations, 
and reactions to certain tastes and smells. Now you have to be careful about these because these overlap with a lot of other disorders. And that's why of course diagnosis gets complicated. Then you have the kids who kind of dig in their heels uh, with sensory. Uh, these are the ones who become a little uh, negative. Um, they try to avoid new experiences in general um, because they're afraid that if, I, if something new, I'm going to have to deal with some sensory stimuli I don't know about it. It might be awful. So they can become aggressive when provoked. They may be a little bit negative. I don't want to do it. They want to be very controlling because they want to keep them, they want to not be subjected to stimuli that is going to feel awful. So they're trying to control their environment. Um, they may become defiant. Uh, they may like repetition because they know what's expected. Don't, don't, don't surprise me because for these kids, a surprise may not be fun because they, they might have to encounter a sight, a sound, a touch that's not pleasant. Um, they often have difficulty adapting to new situations and they can become a little compulsive and perfectionistic because again, that's another way to hyper-focus, focus too much to try to keep stimuli that's unpleasant and they may be a little slow to engage. Now, the other side of the coin are the under-responsive kids. And I want, these are the kids I think who often get missed. These are the kids who are less sensitive to and less aware of sensory stimuli than most kids. These are kids who tend not to cry when seriously hurt, don't seem to notice when they're touched, nearly always prefer sedentary activities. These are the couch potatoes, is unaware of the need to use the bathroom, for example. So it may be harder to toilet train these kids because they're not getting messages from those interoceptors. Um, again, these kids need more sensory input they are generally quiet and watchful. And they may appear unresponsive, but it may not be that they're tuning you out. It just may be that their sensory system isn't turned on, their engine isn't running fast enough. So these kids may appear to lack interest. They may be apathetic, fatigued, easily withdraw from stimuli inattentive. And infants may appear to be delayed, but maybe not. Um, and then of course, uh, then there, oh, so I just want to say about sensory over responsive and under responsive. This gets tricky. Here's where you need a very experienced OT. You can have some sensory, there are some children with what we call a mixed profile. Some of theirs, they may be very sensitive tactilely, but they may be very underreactive visually. And then they may be a little overreactive with motion. So it isn't always a flat profile that if you're over responsive, you're over responsive in every sensory system. You can have a mixed profile and this is very hard to treat. Now there is a category in DSD zero to five other sensory processing disorder. They didn't break it out, but there is a category that many of our OTs feel and there is some empirical evidence for children who have sensory craving. These are kids who need to see, need seem to need more sensory stimulation than most people. They never, they seem to never get enough. Now you know these kinds of kids. If they go on the roller coaster or the merry-go-round once, they they could be on ten times. They never seem to get enough sensory input. These kids are often constantly in motion. They like crashing, bashing, bumping, roughhousing. They like to spin, swing, roll. They like to often always be touching something, they're intrusive, they often may have a hard time, they're the kids who can't stop talking in class, they may seek vibration, they may watch spinning objects, they seem, their body, their sensory systems need to never get enough. Um, and, and, and we see some of these adults too, who may, you know, not on the spectrum, even within the neurotypical, you can have people who are on the over, be sensory overstimulators. These are often the adults who love, love exciting things. They're, they can be a little reckless. They like to skydive. They like motorcycles. Um, uh, they like a lot of sensory input. So um, some of their reactivities, they crave uh, sensory information. Um, they need more motor discharge. They tend to be impulsive. They're the dashers out in the street. They may be accident prone without clumsiness. That's important. 
And um, again, they have may have high activity levels. They may have ADHD and they may have ADHD and sensory processing, uh, sensory craving, sensory seeking. They can be comorbid, co-occurring. Uh, they like a lot of contact with people and objects. They seek stimulation through deep pressure. They can be re reckless and um, they may be disorganized. And even the infants may be over fussy and crave a lot of sensory input. Older children, again, may seek high activity levels. Uh, I, I went over that. Now, it can lead with those kids. This is why we have to watch the sensory cravers, the sensory seekers. It can lead eventually to destruction of property, too much intrusion into other people's physical space. They can appear aggressive. Sometimes they're not really aggressive. They may be just overreacting and they may be overexcited. We have to be very careful as parents and teachers to differentiate between overexcitation and aggression. We don't want to treat overexcitation as aggression because then it is apt to make the child aggressive. Um, so differentiating is important. Again, we often make that mistake. So some red flags about sensory processing disorders in infants, uh, chronic unresolved colic that doesn't go away, general irritability. These are sometimes called fussy babies. Uh, uh, rocky state transitions, hard to get them awake. Hard to get them calmed down, hard to get them to sleep, difficult to soothe. They may have sleep issues. They often don't like novelty. It's too overstimulating. Uh, they may have poor eye contact. They may be on the spectrum or not because you could have a sensory processing disorder without being on the spectrum. But remember, 80% of children, 87% of children on the spectrum do have some form of sensory processing problem. Uh, doesn't want to be held. Some of these kids who are tactically defensive seems most content when alone because they don't want a lot of input uh, and unexplainable fearfulness in everyday life. Now, in preschoolers, you see, of course, these problems from earlier continue. Um, they may have sleeping and eating disturbances. Remember, picky eating can have sometimes to do with an oral motor sensitivity. They don't like certain textures or certain temperatures of food. Um, again, oral sensory, oral motor. Uh, they may like repetitive, stereotypical, non-purposeful play, which we do see often in children on the spectrum, but really they may actually be attempts at regulating themselves. I don't like the word self-stimming because I think most of those behaviors have a function. And often it's the child trying to give themselves what they need. Like your child who likes to be on the ball, he's trying to give himself what he needs. Um, unable to motor plan simple sequences, um, like difficulty sitting in a chair or preparing to sit in a chair, creeping downstairs, mounting a riding toy. Um, they may have communication issues and excessive fear uh, or lack of appropriate fear. Remember, it takes a multidisciplinary team to diagnose and differentiate a sensory processing disorder from other disorders with similar symptoms. So for example, the under-responsive child could look, it could look like depression. So that's why, is it depression? Is it an under sensory under-responsivity? Is it both? This is why we need a very comprehensive assessment. The kids who are sensory seeking look like they're ADHD. They may or may not be. They may be ADHD and sensory seeking. Again, why it needs to be a multidisciplinary team to determine if a sensory processing dysfunction co-occurs with other disorders. And remember, in autism, again, I've said this a lot, 80% of children with autism have some sensory atypicality. Anxiety is a frequent co-occurring feature of autism with a prevalence rate between 42 and 79% of children have co-occurring anxiety. Now, we don't know why. Some of it could be just the way their brain is wired. Some of it could be secondary to the sensory sensitivities. We don't know. Dysregulation, again, may appear as aggression and excitation, but it mis may be misunderstood as aggression by others. So we have to be very careful to know, is it sensory overregulation? Are they over aroused or is it truly aggression? 
Remember, transitions are always triggers, right? The, I always, a transition for our kids, even for typical kids, you have to change, it's changing gears. We got to change gears from one state, being alert, paying attention, to focusing on our food, calming down, or listening to a story. Those are very different states. So whenever we ask a child to change gears about attention, about their, their, their arousal, they need, often will need help. Prepare them for it. Support comprehension, because many of our kids on the spectrum have comprehension problems. Sometimes their verbal expression is better than their receptive language, their understanding of language. So we always want, don't assume they've understood what we've said them. So we always need to support comprehension, like with picture schedules, with gestures, with photographs. And as I was told by our wonderful translator, Anna, that for translation, I have to slow my speech down. Well, often with children on the spectrum, we want to use simple language, we want to reduce the rate and the complexity of our speech. I always say, remember Mr. Rogers. Part of the reason I think children of a certain age liked him so much because he spoke in a simple, low, slow rate that they could process. And remember, routine is very, very important for all children. For all children, consistency is important, but especially for children on the spectrum and children with sensory processing disorders. Um, because it helps them to know what to expect. And uh, it helps them make those transitions and to feel safe and to feel safe. Okay, so what are some of the impact of sensory processing disorders on mental health? Remember sensory modulation, if you're overreactive or underreactive, it can disrupt the parent-infant attachment re uh, relationship. and it isn't always because as parents that, th that there's something, a problem with the parent. I really wanna say that these children, children on the spectrum, children with sensory processing and problems can be very confusing, even for very good loving parents because they send us mixed signals. And so they can disrupt our relationship. Those fussy babies, even for loving, wonderful parents, they're a handful. And you didn't, if, if the child has ASD or a sensory processing disorder, you didn't cause it. Now, there are things we can do to help it or maybe make it worse, but we didn't cause it. It's inborn part of the central nervous system. Of course, a parent can struggle to meet their child's needs. Uh, and, and it often can help make parents and teachers feel, you know, that we're not competent or satisfied as a nurturer. Remember, problems with motivation, self-control affects interpersonal skills in general. It can create friction, not only between a child and a parent, but between parents and other family members. You know, we have to prepare our, prepare our relatives to know what to expect with our child with a sensory processing disorder or ASD. That doesn't mean they don't need structure and they don't need discipline, but, you know, we take them to an aunt or an uncle and they'll say, you know, if they're, you don't have enough discipline. If you only crack down, that child would behave. If the child has ASD or a sensory processing problem, it's more than just discipline, right? They may need these other kinds like a sensory diet to help them co-regulate. And of course, institutions, preschools and, and schools. And again, a child's sensory related behaviors may trigger your own frustration and your own memories of unpleasant experiences from your childhood or traumas from your own childhood. So it may, can make us more sensitive. And remember that some of the sensory processing disorders, they can co-occur with mental health disorders or they can kind of imitate mental health disorders. So that's why we need very careful diagnoses to differentiate is it a mental health problem? Is it a sensory problem? Is it both? And of course, trauma. Children who have been traumatized, they may appear to have uh, problems that look sensory. Um, it may not be an actual sensory processing disorder. You may see dissociation where they shut down. You may see them being oversensitive, overreactive, overcautious. 
again, that may result not from their sensory nervous system, but from the trauma they've experienced. Or you could have both. They could have a sensory processing problem and have had a traumatic child. Okay, so uh, that brings us to the end of my presentation. And uh, so maybe, um, maybe we have some questions. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Foley, for such a great presentation. We do have a few questions, um, course, and we are definitely. opening the floor up to questions to those who are watching us uh, via Zoom. Um, so right now, we do have um, one parent asking how to manage high pay tolerance. But if I tickled my daughter, she will say, you're hurting me. Well, again, I, I would always advise you to go back to the OT who might be a help is in your, you know, in your program. Uh, again, I, for those kinds of kids, I would avoid light touch. I would avoid tickling and I would do more deep touch like squish, 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 or deep pressure at the shoulder girdle, avoiding light touch for tactically defensive kids. I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, at one point, I saw a lot of adult patients. Um, I still occasionally see adults. But I had a patient, this was years ago, a, a really interesting guy. And he, um, he came because of a relationship issue with his wife. But it turned out, as we understood his history, he, he was dyslexic, uh, had reading problems growing up. And, um, um, and he was very successful in the computer industry, which he, he attributed, by the way, to his dyslexia, because he said, I could solve problems out of the box that no one else could. But my story was that in taking his history, he remember, he also had a lot of sensory issues. And he remembered, uh, he used to go visit an uncle in a city about 20 miles away. And that uncle used to tickle him. And he, he could remember as an adult, it was like torture. And he would kick and bite and scream. Then he got in trouble from his parents because he was being aggressive. But the reality was that tickling felt terrible. So light touch can be very aversive to some of these tactically defensive kids. Think deep, deeper, deeper sensation or, or rubbing them. Now, some OTs prescribe something called brushing. I'm not saying that's right for your child. I don't know. That would have to come from OT where you use a surgical brush and you give deep pressure and they can find that 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 much more um, than light touch. Thank you, Dr. Foley. And we do have another parent asking. Um, I would like to know if Dr. Foley could give me any advice um, before going to have his have her child get a haircut. For about a year now, he's telling her that he is afraid. Um, a, he used to be able to tolerate a haircut, but he can no longer and cries. Yeah. Well, many of the kids who have a, a tactile a, a don't do not like haircuts because remember, um, the hair follicles are very, very sensitive. And, you know, we sometimes do for, for neurotypical kids, you know, we'll sometimes do this and tussle their hair. And that might be fun for a kid with a tactile defensive problem that often feels awful. Um, and you don't want to do that. So um, again, you know, how might you prepare him? Um, you know, I would, I would, I would try to find a barber that you felt you could work with, who would, um, you know, approach it. Maybe would help him look at, of course, not hurt himself, but play with it, you know, with the the scissors a little bit and turn the the, the clippers on and off. They're also, again, I would always recommend an OT. They may recommend some experiences before you go, or even when you're there, that involves some compression, a little deep compression on the hair, um, working with someone who, you know, will take breaks. Um, because again, uh, my guess is, I don't know this, but and I, again, always defer to an OT, that having a haircut might just feel like an awful experience and and um, and probably important that you're there and you might need to give him a little compression at the shoulder girdle, uh, keep, keep some deep pressure when he's, of course, you have to be careful not to interfere with the barber, but, uh, or at least he can see you in the mirror so he feels comforted that you're there and you're providing some co-regulation. Um, but many of the kids with tactile sensitivities. You know, I have to tell this to you, and, and, and 
you know, it may be a little too revealing, but as an adult, I'm an old man now, looking back, I had a lot of those sensory problems. I hated getting my hair cut. I couldn't wear woolens for a long time. I still really can't. I like woolens, but the only way I can wear woolens, like woolen pants, is they have to be lined. I still find them itchy and irritating. Um, so, you know, uh, and, and, and it's real. I'm not making it up. And your child's not making it up. Thank you, Dr. Pauline. We do have a few more questions. Um, Ms. Sara is asking, she has a three-year-old son, um, and she mentions that when they're out on the street or in the community, he wants to run, and he's running without any regard for danger or safety. Is there something that she can do to help him? Well, that is a complicated issue, of course, because he could hurt himself. So I, I would say there, you know, Probably having an evaluation would be a very good place to start. I mean, might he have ADHD? Possibly. Might he have a sensor, be a sensory seeker? Possibly. Could he have, uh, you know, ADHD and sensory seeking? Possibly. I don't know the answers to those. So I would say a thorough diagnosis. Um, you know, he is the kind of kid you may need to take his hand. I know he's probably not going to like it so much but um you know uh, and also having now when you're out it's hard to do but in the house having some clear boundaries for him such as the suggestion from susan you know sitting when he's playing sitting within a hula hoop and he knows that's his special place not to go out putting some tape on the floor to help him know there's a boundary of course he'll violate it but at least helps him to realize gives him some place to function um and um uh, you know, uh, trying to have him go to a playground where there is some enclosure and there's some boundary where he can run, but isn't going to run into the street and, and hurt himself. Thank you, Dr. Foley. And we do have Miss Margarita. Uh, she's asking, so informative. Thank you. D I didn't realize anxiety often is comorbid with ASD. How does one address the anxiety or know it's anxiety? Okay, so again, I go back to diagnosis, um, you know, to know whether, I mean, a child can have an anxiety disorder and not have a sensory processing disorder, but a child who has a sensory processing disorder or ASD has a very strong likelihood of having uh, comorbid anxiety. And uh, typically, you know, anxious kids are, um, they're they're over vigilant. They're over cautious. They're they're a little worried. Um, they may shy away from things. They may have some timidity. Um, you may get avoidance of of situations that appear uh, frightening. And I think we have to start out first of all again with a careful diagnosis to know whether the anxiety is comorbid with ASD, with a sensory processing disorder. Is it an anxiety disorder itself? Um, and then trying to figure out what is the child fearful of and how can we try to create more security. So it's hard for me to tell you what particularly to do, of course, because I don't know your child. But I would say get, if, if he has, um, if your child is in a program where there is a, a multi-sensor, a multidisciplinary team, I, I think that's a place to start. Thank you, Dr. Fuller. And I think often, you know, a lot of these kids, this is one of the reasons I wrote the book with Susan Stalling Sailor, is that often mental health professionals and, you know, we have to work with OTs, of course, with all the professions, but because some of these disorders look similar or they may be comorbid. So the, the child, you know, the anxious child may need some counseling along with sensory integration. Again, it all depends on the, on the diagnostic profile. Thank you, Dr. Foley. And we do have about three minutes left, so I'll be taking just a few questions. If I don't get to your question, um, you're more than welcome to email me and I'll pass those along to Dr. Foley. Um, so we'll just continue with a few more. Um, Ms. Jasmine is asking, um, she's having an is a situation with her son at his school. He takes off his clothes, but especially um, the issues with his shoes and his socks. Is there anything that you could recommend? Well, you know, many kids who are tactfully defensive and on the spectrum find shoes and socks very, again, aversive. So I would say, you know, if 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 it's that aversive, can when he's at school, can he wear slippers or can he wear a pair of those heavy socks that have some uh, material on the bottom so he won't slip? Um, 
and then incrementally help him to see whether you can get him into some shoes. But if it's if it's that offensive to him, I start out with respecting the child. I think he may be telling you it feels awful. It may not just be he's trying to be difficult or oppositional. It may be that that really feels awful. So I would find some alternate kinds of things for him to wear in in the uh, in in the class. Where I consult the school, we have one child who we allow to be barefoot because he really can't tolerate shoes and socks yet. Now we're working with the OT to start, you know, giving him deep pressure on the feet, helping him to tolerate more input, eventually maybe get a sock on him, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Bolling. And we do have another parent. Um, she's asking, my son repeats a lot. Um, for example, he will say something up to 10 times. How can we work on that? Well, again, I would, uh, it's a little hard for me to say, it, 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 if he is on the spectrum, we know, you know, echolalia and and sometimes repet repetition is, um, is, is a part of the, it's a part of the picture. Um, Again, uh, I would, I would, I would, I would say here. I would speak. I would work with his speech and language pathologist. Now, of course, some people have different opinions. The the people I work with, we we often think that you know echolalia. You want to. It, it's not always dysfunctional, so you have to ask yourself: Is what he's repeating or words he's borrowing from, let's say, a movie or a TV, a script? But sometimes children use them functionally, even though they sound like they're just a script. But sometimes if you think about where they're saying it and the context, it may make sense. So I would say, you know, again, starting with your team and your speech language pathologist would, would be a place to start. Thank you, Dr. Foley. And this is the very last question I'll take for today. Again, if I didn't get to your question, I'll make sure that we'll, we'll have them answered and sent to you. Um, the last question is, would you suggest seeking out a pediatric OT specialist for a 14-year-old? My son hasn't seen an OT outside of school for about six years now. Yeah, that is a very good question. Well, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I can't recommend any particular a clinic. I mean, there are OTs that do work with uh, older children in the city. Um, I mean, and that, a place to start might be with some an OT you know, or an OT that worked with your child younger. They might know some OTs, and of course, some hospitals. You know, you would might want if he's fourteen. You usually find OTs in in hospitals. Now, there it might be more in a rehab department, but there might be someone who's willing to work with sensory issues. Uh, but again, they're going to have to be sensory um, sensory processing trained. I know an adult, for example, who has um, hypersensitivity to sound, can't be in restaurants, and all that goes crazy. He went to an OT as an adult and found it quite helpful, um, but. Uh, I, I can't, I don't know a specific, I don't want to, I can't really recommend any, you know, but that would be inappropriate, but I, I would say start with an OT, you know, or maybe start with a, uh, with your physician or start with a hospital setting and they might be able to direct you to someone appropriate. Or you may go online and look at this. I, I don't know this. There is a sensory integration organization. Now, I have no idea if they have like a referral list or a, uh, you know, like a, uh, people who are actually certified in sensory integration, um, that might be a place to look and see. And there, there might be someone in your area that is sensory integration certified, and that might be a place to start. Thank you so much, Dr. Foley. So we have concluded our presentation for today, everybody. If you could please just stay on for a few more seconds just for a poll, uh, we'd greatly appreciate it. But other than that, thank you so much for coming and joining us here today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Foley. Again, any questions we didn't get to, please feel free to uh, write them to my email. I did place that information in the chat, um, and I'll make sure those arrive to Dr. Foley, and you'll be able to have your response. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining today. Okay. Thank you, everybody.